We have Russ Crandall here today, Hi. who is the writer behind TheDomesticMan.com, a food blog focusing on classic and traditional foods that fit in an ancestral template. His debut cookbook, The Ancestral Table, Traditional Recipes for a Paleo Lifestyle, was released in February. Give him another round of applause. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, coming out. Um, I really appreciate you uh, coming to visit. I know this is a, a premium as far as your attention and time and that kind of stuff, so I appreciate it. So uh, when coming up with this presentation, the first thing that kind of came to mind was that um, have you guys heard of Sever magazine? It's a gourmet style magazine, pretty popular, very famous. Uh, so two years ago, Michelle Tam was uh, nominated and awarded the best special diets category uh, food blog award from 2012. In 2013, my blog was nominated. I didn't win, but uh, that's another story. This year, they didn't nominate any paleo blogs. So uh, for me, that was, it was kind of a wake-up call in that uh, a very widely recognized magazine who's known for really looking at vi visually appealing, really well-known dishes didn't even look at paleo recipes at all. So um, it's kind of heartbreaking and sad in that sense. And I thought, well, why is that? Why are we missing out on this kind of accolade? And the first thing I realized was, well, we're a new movement, you know. The, the vegans have been around for a long time. The vegetarians have been around longer. So uh, it may just be that we need to refine a little bit. And if we're going to refine, how are we going to do that? And so the best way of looking at that is traditional gourmet foods. So uh, with that in mind, I thought, well, what can I do on my end, you know, having a few years' experience as a chef in restaurants before uh, kind of just doing it at home from then on, uh, what can I do to kind of give some suggestions at the, just the most basic level of how we can kind of up our game as a kind of paleo movement? So this is really what this presentation is going to be about. Just some really simple beginner kind of level ideas and things that we can all do to kind of push up our game. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is my principle of an ancestral gourmet cuisine. So the idea behind this is the fact that for thousands of years we've been cooking and we've been refining these dishes despite the fact that due to technology we haven't been able to actually have access to a lot of ingredients but despite that fact we came up with some really brilliant and nutritious meals very tasty things uh, those traditional foods were then you know further refined into what we call gourmet cuisine today which is really that that high level very expensive kind of food you find which amazingly enough is very kind of paleo when you look at it you know so so looking at these gourmet cuisines and then looking at the fact that now with technology, we have access to every ingredient on, on the planet, but still we have a very, very limited way of eating here in America. So we've also seen that you know, through nutritional studies and research and things like that, that certain foods are better than others. So what we should do is look at those really good foods that are good for us, and then also put them together in this really refined way of cooking and having this basically perfect way of eating, which is what I like to call ancestral gourmet cuisine. So that's kind of the foundation I have as far as uh, coming up with my steps. So let's just dig in right into the steps. So number one, and again, I mentioned this is very basic. We're starting at the beginner level. Uh, number one is knowing your fats, right? So in particular, when you are cooking in a high heat, you want to use uh, a saturated fat, something usually derived from an animal that has a higher smoke point, much more stable at high temperatures. So that's just kind of a basic across the board. So instead of having a tub of virgin coconut oil and you're putting it on everything, uh, flavor-wise and nutritionally, that's just not the best thing to do. So I have here li uh, listed, when you're frying, roasting, or browning a meat, it's best to use something like lard, tallow, uh, ghee, duck fat, uh, and then refined coconut oil, which has a much higher smoke point. When you're doing something like sauteing or including something in a much cooler dish, then you want to use you know, your virgin coconut oils. Butter is good at that point because it's not getting high enough to burn. Um, as well as olive oil is good at a low temperature. And then the other side of that is the broth. So we, we talk about broth all the time, but uh, too many times I see that you, know, you have a, a beef roast, and what do you do? Oh, you add beef broth to it. Uh, and that just is kind of intuitive, but the problem is that that makes a very one-dimensional dish. So it's actually better to include a different broth when you are cooking something like a beef roast. So if you use chicken broth, which sounds counterintuitive and sounds a little weird, it actually comes with a much deeper, more developed flavor profile. So just kind of think about that when you're roasting something. Uh, don't just make this super beefy dish, you know, try to throw in something else. Pork broth, uh, veal broth, even if you've got access to that. All these kind of different broths that gourmet cuisines use. They don't just use beef broth with the beef roast. So that's, that's step number one. It's just kind of looking at our fats and our broths. 
Step number two. So we've all heard the umami word, right? Which is that, that fifth kind of flavor profile, which is this uh, salty, sweet kind of flavor. Tastiness is what they say in Hawaii. My wife's from Hawaii. So, um, so there's certain foods that are very high in what they call glutamates. And these glutamates uh, are interesting in that we, we tend to crave these foods, these specific uh, kind of molecules that, that we really kind of go for just naturally. We don't even think about it. And so the, the, the major theory behind that is because many of the foods that have high glutamates, so fermented foods, cured foods, bacon, that kind of thing, are much higher in microbes than other foods. So we're, we're naturally going after those extra bugs to get into our system, which is then making us healthier and feeding us and more satisfied, that kind of thing. So it's always good to incorporate high glutamate foods into your diet. So by high glutamate foods, I mean things like seafood, uh, you know, meats, especially cured meats, mushrooms, tomatoes, seaweed, fermented foods, all those kind of foods all together uh, really up the flavor profile, but also nutritionally, they're really good for you too. Uh, and again, like I mentioned, they are naturally sought out by humans in every culture, so there's something to that. You know, there's wisdom in traditional practices. So in that sense, I think it's really cool. Number three, acids. So uh, I think this is one of the more underrated ways of cooking is, is including acids. We don't really think about it, you know. So. I think a deliberate way of seasoning with acids, the same way you would with salt and pepper, is extremely important. So let's go over that real quick. So there's really kind of four different uh, branches of acids that I came up with. Number one is acetic acids, which is your vinegars. We all know our, our different kinds of apple cider vinegar, white vinegar, wine vinegar, that kind of thing. Uh, and then tartaric acids, which is uh, what you get in wine, which is similar to vinegar. Wine is just vinegar that hasn't turned to vinegar yet. And uh, tamarind, which is a, a natural plant that you can use that's very uh, kind of sour flavored. Lactic acids, so that's all of your milk-based acids, so buttermilk, sour cream, yogurt, uh, and then fruits and vegetables. So certain fruits, especially citrus fruits, are really uh, high in acidity, so they're very good to use, as well as onion and garlic and tomatoes. So exactly how are we going to use these acids is important. So number one is a marinade. So if you do not use an acid in a marinade, it technically, in the culinary world, world is not a marinade. It is just a flavoring. You need those acids in order to denature or to help cure those meats. Uh, so whenever you're making a marinade, if you make it olive oil and seasoning marinade, it's not. You're just flavoring the outside of the meat. It's never going to penetrate inside. So those acids help to do that. Um, only lactic acids actually tenderize meat. Everything else denatures the meat. So it's, it's a different kind of flavor. That's why you can't throw vinegar on meat and leave it for three days. It becomes like mush, you know, and that's why it's being denatured. So uh, the other side of that is with vegetables. You know, if you use acidulated water, which is just basically water with usually white wine, or, I'm sorry, white vinegar in it, and you steam your vegetables in that, it maintains the color, the vibrancy, probably the nutritional profile as well, uh, much better than if you just steamed it in regular water. The other side of that is seasoning with acids. So at the end of a meal, right when you're finishing up, instead of just seasoning with salt and pepper to taste, adding in a splash of vinegar uh, really does enhance the flavor and it deepens everything. So that's also a very important thing to do. And you can see here Thomas Keller, uh, who is you know, one of the great American chefs of our time, wrote, you don't necessarily want to taste the vinegar, you just want to feel its effects. So really just a splash of it really makes that big difference. Okay, so going along the same lines of using acids and that kind of thing is sauces. So every culture has some sort of sauce, be it a, a gravy, a chutney, a salsa, all these kind of different uh, flavorings that they add onto other things. And that's, that's done on purpose, you know, it's to add complexity. And again, humans are driven towards these complex flavors. So uh, we should always kind of, when you make a roast, think about, okay, what are you going to do with the leftover broth, you know, you would reduce it, add some sort of wine or something like that to give it a second flavor to it. So that's always something to try to kind of think about. And I like to put it into three different categories. First you have your fats, then you have your body, and then you have your seasoning. And that's basically the, the template for every single sauce. So for example, here I have a, uh, a roux based gravy. So what you do is you, you have your drippings from, this is from chicken fried steak right here. Uh, you have your butter, which is going to melt into the, the, uh, the drippings and everything like that. And then you add a little bit of flour. So this can be coconut flour, rice flour, whatever way you swing in the paleo spectrum. Uh, and then you add some sort of broth and seasonings to give it that rest of that body and flavor. So uh, it's always really good whenever you're making any sort of dish is to think, okay, what sauce is going to be with it, right? And it's a, it's a little extra step. And it's something that we usually don't think about, especially on a weeknight. But I think it's really important to kind of up the game 
as far as presenting a dish and that kind of thing. Okay, number five, five out of six. So this is one of my favorite techniques. This is called pan roasting. So really what you do is instead of putting a whole chicken or a roast or something like that in a roasting pan and putting it in the oven, which makes sense intuitively, a lot of restaurants put it directly onto a skillet, something they're going to be making gravy with later. So you can see here, it's a roast chicken here from my book, uh, but we put it directly on a, a stainless skill, steel skillet pan, put it in the oven for an hour, then when we take it out, it's got all the drippings, all the fat, everything's already there. I pull the chicken off. When it's resting, then I add my flour, and then I add my body with the broth and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's not having to use an extra dish, which is important for me because I hate washing dishes. Uh, but at the same time, too, you're not losing any of that flavor anywhere. So it's a great way of preserving the flavor, uh, you know, really kind of keeping everything together at once. So uh, this is a really good technique, and I think it's something that uh, I really like other people to kind of start using more often. You know, let's, let's save dishes, and uh, I think treating something like this makes a dish less intimidating, you know, and I think that's also important. Okay, so the last suggestion. I'm kind of breezing through these. So the other thing about cooking with meats is that, uh, especially in the beginning stages of cooking, and a lot of people come into paleo not having cooked before, uh, one important thing is that they look at the recipe and they just do it literally. But unfortunately, every kitchen is different. So uh, one important fact is that every, every, so every piece of meat is different. Every little thing is different. You know, the temperature in your oven is probably not calibrated correctly. You know, no one's is really. Um, so it's, it's important, instead of looking at, say it says to cook something for eight minutes, you should cook for other kind of uh, characteristics. So the most important of those is temperature, right? Especially with when you're talking with red meats and poultry and things like that. Um, and then color is also important, especially with vegetables. And then texture. I mean, it's much better to use your own eyes to figure out when a dish is done as opposed to an arbitrary number that you see based on a recipe that, that was done in somebody else's kitchen. So, uh, I like to break it down into two different categories. Basically, when you're using a lean meat, which can be anything from poultry to a, you know, a brisket or something like that, you're going to want to use a thermometer to check exactly the temperature. You know, something like a pork loin, you cannot look at the outside texture and see, okay, it's ready to go. Uh, because inside, it's very hard to tell when it's ready. Uh, but then when you're using a lesser cut, something that's much fattier, a lot of connective tissue, um, or something like seafood or vegetables, it's much better to go with how it feels and how it looks as far as determining when it's done. And all of those have their own little kind of sets, you know, a seafood uh, is cooked much, much differently than, you know, a pork shoulder. But at the same time, this technique of using the, the idea of uh, the texture or the look of it instead of the, the time that is associated with it is much more important. So really guys, that's all I had. Um, the last thought I had was that when, really when you're in doubt, the most, thing you, most important thing you should think of is what would great grandma do, right? So this idea is that there is wisdom in traditional foods, in traditional methods that's been developed over thousands and thousands of years. So it would just be, it'd be presumptuous of us to think that, oh, we're gonna, we started this new movement, it's using all these new ideas, and we're just going to start cooking from scratch right now and then move it on from ourselves. The better idea, I think, is to kind of look back and look at history and say, okay, over time, they've always done it this way. Why is that? and then kind of looking at that, piecing it together, and then implementing it into a paleo spectrum. So that's all I had. I know, I'm super early probably, so thank you.